On this edition of Geopolitics and Empire, we interview strategic risk consultant and best-selling author F. William Engdahl. We'll be talking about his latest book, Manifest Destiny, and the latest in geopolitics, economy, war, Trump, and empire. Let's start with the main idea of your latest book, Manifest Destiny. Now, I wrote my graduate thesis on this topic of U.S.-sponsored democratic regime change, otherwise known as color revolutions, about a decade ago. And in my thesis, I tried to look at a color revolution that was not written much about. And so I looked at Mongolia in the 1990s because I spent some time there as a Peace Corps volunteer. And I was surprised to discover the same U.S. State Department, National Endowment for Democracy, NED, Soros, Open Society formula at play there that you detail in your book, Manifest Destiny. And after the Soviet Union fell, Sure enough, James Baker paid a visit to Ulaanbaatar, uh, Mongolia, the capital, and the young Mongolian named Elbigdorj, who was educated in the U.S. at Harvard, just like Saakashvili, the former leader of, uh, of Georgia, and Elbigdorj founded a liberty center, uh, which Saakashvili did as well in Georgia with the same name, uh, and um, they were both funded by Soros, NED, USAID, and I documented that about Mongolia. And um, interesting that El Bigdorj eventually became the president in 2009. And so in your book, Manifest Destiny, you basically look at how Washington has systematically attempted to take over nation after nation, including Poland, Yugoslavia, Russia, China, Georgia, Ukraine. So could you, for listeners, describe this basic framework or template that Washington uses to take down foreign governments in a way that makes it look like Washington had nothing to do with it? What happened in the 1980s, there was a whole series of congressional investigations, exposés, whistleblowers, uh, et cetera, about the illegal activities of the CIA, assassinations of people like Pinochet in Chile, uh, the coup d'etat against Mossadegh in Iran, uh, in Guatemala, Albania, uh, and so forth. And so as damage control, Reagan's head of CIA, uh, Bill Casey, proposed a privatization of this regime change machine instead of you know using CIA agents on the street in, in civilian clothes who can be discovered and then revealed as a government operation. He said, let's do it through private NGOs, non-governmental organizations. And then if if they're caught, you know, uh, in some attempt in some country, uh, we can always say, oh, that's that's private. We can't control what private foundations do. They want human rights, liberty, democracy. That's, uh, you know, you allow them to work in your country. So, you know, we have no, et cetera. And that was actually, at the beginning, a brilliant and very effective way to get rid of regimes that Washington didn't like. And this... Uh, was rolled out uh, in one of the earliest uh, experiments in Poland with the help of the Pope, John Paul II, who had a secret meeting with uh, President Reagan and worked out an agreement where the Pope would be informed of the CIA's activities in, in Poland with Solidarność, the trade union movement, and then would uh, appear in, in Poland in the streets and, and give support to the fight for liberty and freedom. And that, of course, ultimately led to the, the toppling of, of the communist government. And then, uh, one by one, uh, you know, the communist countries in the East Bloc uh, began uh, falling down. It was, it was financially rotten, the uh, manipulations of, of the U.S. with collapsing the oil price in 1986 and so had, had created that. But then uh, what George Bush Sr., uh, someone who, to my view, does not deserve any kind of uh, uh, praise or, or thanks from, from the nation or the world for, for the evil that he did in, in his lifetime. But George Bush Sr. worked with a group of old cronies from the CIA, CIA old boys, and uh, they locked in with the 
very senior level of KGB operatives, KGB officers, senior officers, head of uh, international organization and, you know, really top level guys. And they pulled off this coup known as Boris Yeltsin. Boris Yeltsin was, was a, uh, uh, an asset of the CIA, of the, of the Bush crowd. And what they did was, was to uh, not only bring down communism in the Soviet Union, but uh, they brought in key economic advisors like Professor Jeffrey Sachs from Harvard University and others to organize the privatization through criminal bands who are today called the oligarchs, the Russian oligarchs, uh, and began looting that country to the bone. And George Soros was involved in, in that process. He was picking up crown jewels uh, left and right, and uh, uh, Bush was involved, uh, many people from the West, uh, until 1999 when uh, it really wasn't possible to push it anymore and a nationalist faction came in behind uh, Vladimir Putin. That's another story. So the book traces, uh, wh why do I call it Manifest Destiny? Well, in the 19th century America, as, as, as you well know, that was an ideology of empire. We have a destiny from God to uh, essentially dominate the world. And it was a very powerful inner ideology of, of uh, the elite families, the powers that be uh, in those days, 1880s, 1890s. And that justified not only the uh, Spanish-American War and the acquisition of the first colony, the Philippines, but also pushing all the way toward China in the Pacific and, and uh, through uh, Latin and South America and, and beyond. So the idea of manifest destiny and the book is really about how this machinery of fake democracy has been created. Fake human rights, NGOs like Open Society Foundation, the National Endowment for Democracy, which is a U.S. government financed CIA controlled uh, NGO, but it masquerades as as you know a private uh, freedom loving enterprise. It's anything but that. Uh, one of the key figures uh, before his uh, death was John McCain, the senator from Arizona. One of the uh, some people say one of the most treasonous figures in the U.S. Senate in, in recent history. Uh, that history will have to judge, but but uh, certainly not not one of the. Uh, white hats are one of the good guys. And uh, he was president of the Republican Institute, which was an arm of the National Endowment for Democracy. He was involved in the CIA coup d'etat in Ukraine in 2013-14, directly involved, along with uh, Victoria Newland of the State Department, whose husband is one of the leading neoconservatives, and uh, <coughs> Vice President Joe Biden, who never was up to anything good wherever he went. And so you, um, speaking of empire and, and Europe, you know, nowadays with Trump uh, and all this talk uh, about NATO not paying its dues and all this back and forth that's, that's happening, uh, if we could kind of go back and forth in time, in your book you describe uh, the Europeans, so I suppose in the 1980s and 1990s, that Europeans, leading Europeans viewed America as a declining empire. Um, and so they were kind of set to, I guess, replace a little bit of that unilateral U.S. world or, or challenge a bit of it. And at yeah. the same time, we saw Saddam wanting to trade oil, uh, not in dollars exclusively, but in euros. Uh, and so the U.S. invaded Iraq in the 1990s. And we've had on... Ale I'm not sure that was the only reason, but uh, mm -hmm. it was one of the reasons, yeah. And we've previously interviewed Alistair McLeod of Gold Money, uh, who wrote about Chinese military analysts saying, um, you know, that was one of the reasons for Yugoslavia as well, to the, the war in Yugoslavia that the U.S. Uh, also uh, interfered in and helped stoke uh, to kind of, I guess, so delay the, the EU project. Uh, I, I'm not sure. And so... We see the U.S. continue seemingly con trying to go against the EU, whether it's Brexit or forcing the EU to stop buying cheap Russian energy and instead to purchase expensive U.S. Uh, gas, uh, as well as 
the sanctions not allowing the EU to do business uh, with Iran. So could you talk about that section in your book, uh, what's going on with the, the EU-US relationship? Well, the European economic community back in the 50s, the coal and steel union between France and Germany, was a project encouraged not only by Winston Churchill, but by the CIA and the, and the US president to create an entity that they could better control in the, in the Cold War period and create larger markets for US exports and so forth. Well, as Europe got on its feet in the, in the late 60s and 70s, uh, that calculus had begun to change. Uh, now, uh, the period you're talking about uh, in the 80s and the 90s, the governments in Washington were concerned that Europe not develop an indef independent defense pillar, that it not be after the end of the Cold War, that it not be uh, its own decider of, of what, you know, what its military and defense policy would be, that it would be dependent on NATO, which means dependent on the U.S. And so they quite effectively uh, killed off the part of the Maastricht Treaty of 1990 that called for a European defense pillar. They said, no, this, uh, this will be called NATO and it will stay NATO. And then uh, the military industrial complex uh, uh, began creating lobbies in Washington, advocating the spreading of NATO to the east in violation of the solemn pledge that James Baker gave to Gorbachev for the unification of Germany. And uh, so they uh, made sure that Europe was, was not uh, independent. And I think the reason for the Yugoslav war, there were several uh, elements to it. One was, and the, the war was, uh, this you probably know very well, but the war was instigated, manipulated, and led by Washington, by the CIA, by uh, the Bush administration. They submitted laws to Congress. They lied about the... Uh, uh, events in, in uh, former Yugoslavia and uh, about Serbia and so forth. They created a one-sided narrative to uh, while they were financing genocide, essentially in Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, through uh, Bin Laden. Bin Laden was in uh, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina during during the war. He was brought there by the CIA with uh, radical. Uh, Arab jihadists from Saudi Arabia and elsewhere that had fought in Afghanistan. So they were there training the uh, Muslim forces of, of Izzet um, And this is something uh, few people are, are aware of. So what, what came out of that was, uh, number one, the balkanization of a country that could have provided, I, I think it could have provided kind of a middle way economic model between radical free market uh, transformation, which is the, the Harvard, uh, you know, shock therapy, IMF policy, and a centralized state planning. It, it uh, had the elements of, of a transition, you know, uh, between the two that could have been imitated by, you know, many of the former communist economies, especially Russia. Uh, so that model was effectively destroyed. And also, they created the basis to put huge military base, NATO base, called Camp Bon Steel in uh, Kosovo uh, after, the, after the war. So there were many levels of it, but I think the primary one was to say, we, NATO, Washington, are running the military show here and don't get any ideas. I think what's going on now with Trump and, and the NATO, you're not paying your fair share, is a slightly different agenda, but we can talk about that later. And I just wanted to comment on that section uh, <clears throat> of the book on Yugoslavia. It creates a little bit of cognitive dissonance in me because I'm a Croatian-American. And so I kind of like, I don't, it's kind of confusing, you know, regarding allegiances. But, and, and one reason I recommend people pick up the, the book, uh, is, you know, I've, you source. You have a lot of good sources from official government documents, and I, I looked some of them up. And you mentioned regarding Yugoslavia, um, 
the October 27th, 1990, I believe, Foreign Operations Appropriations Act 101-513. So basically what happened in the 1980s, I guess, you have the whole Bretton Woods IMF system. They get you, the country into debt, Yugoslavia. Uh, and then, you know, they're never going to be able to pay that debt. And then at the same time, they give them foreign aid, I guess, to help them kind of service that debt. And then when it comes time, they, in this Appropriations Act, they were saying U.S. was going to stop giving the foreign aid, which would collapse uh, Yugoslavia. And then it actually says, like, it's unbelievable. I have a Croatian colleague that works with me, and I was telling telling them this today, and they, they couldn't believe, believe it. It says, all the individual republics of Yugoslavia uh, need to hold free and fair elections so as not to have this uh, aid removed so i mean it's there in the government documents and then you quote sir alfred sherman saying the war in bosnia was america's war in every sense of the word the u.s helped start it kept it going and prevented its early end so again i mean it's 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 documented yeah it's it's just shocking it was shocking to me as i got deeper into the research i my first book in, in Serbo or Croatian or Serbo-Croatian language was translated into Croatian in 1999. And I was invited uh, by the translator who later became my Croatian publisher uh, many, many times to Croatia to give speeches at universities and, and so forth. And the book was a bestseller. And at that time, I did not understand this larger dimension of the war. When I did, and when I wrote that with the documentation you're talking about, uh, her contact, and, and uh, I considered her and her husband uh, really dear friends, simply broke off. She, she could not look at that. And, you know, in war, there are very few good guys, but uh, uh, in this one, it, it really was... Uh, um, it was... It's horrible. They forced everybody to begin making war against every other part of Yugoslavia. Every uh, Slovenia was on the edge, and they somehow avoided the worst of it. But uh, uh, Croatia, Serbia, uh, the Bosniaks, the Muslim uh, uh, ethnic uh, people in in Bosnia Herzegovina, and uh, you know, it just it's just tragedy beyond belief. Mm-hmm. And coming back then to the color revolutions, I mean, I don't think we have to go too much into detail. You've given interviews on this uh, recently, so people can go listen to those to get into more detail. They can read your book. But the gist of it is, you know, from 2000 with Serbia, 2003, Georgia, 2004, Ukraine, and on, and Kyr- Kyrgyzstan. So these, the U.S. State Department, the NED, the USAID, Soros Open Society, all these foundations come in and start funding and, and training youth and, and overthrow um, these countries. And so if we can kind of then bring it up to today and what's happening now is interesting in, in France. And I read an article, I think it was the National Review, I'm not sure, called the Tax Revolt in France. And this yellow vest movement, and they're saying that it's the first color revolution, yellow, not sponsored by the U.S. State Department, NED, USAID, or Soros. And we know that Macron is an agent of the elite. He worked literally for Rothschild, uh, and he's an EU uh, yes man, and he tried to implement this austerity global warming tax. So do you think the yellow vests are an organic movement, or is this the U.S. again taking a shot at the EU? I'm convinced. Excuse me. I'm convinced that the yellow vest uh, movement is is organic and and real, and this is what has Macron and the, his backers, the bankers in, in Paris and, and Brussels, freaked out. And uh, at first, they didn't. You know, they thought it would go away, and uh, they tried. He tried to ignore it. He didn't make any public statements. And then people came in from the countryside. Uh, I live in Germany, and uh, as you know. And uh, go often to two or three hours drive to France, and you see that the standard of living has, has deteriorated steadily over, over the past uh, years, the past couple of decades. And uh, you know, people kind of live a gray life. And it used to be that to go to France, it was 
uh, joie de vivre and people were happy and uh, enjoyed good food and uh, uh, wonderful wine and uh, fellowship and uh, you know friendship and uh, that that you don't see it's if people are struggling to you know to pay the rent or to to if they own a house to simply feed their family and and uh, the taxes go up and the benefits go down and you know it's just horrendous so and then comes macron with this very strange manipulated election i have a gut feeling that uh, uh marine le pen the conservative i don't call her right wing left wing but the conservative uh, candidate uh, actually probably won the election but they manipulated the thing uh so that macron becomes a surprise winner in the, before the runoff, it was uh, within two percent of each other. Macron was simply given the media backup from the elite. You know, they own the media. The uh, uh, defense, uh, Dassault, the defense industry, and so forth. And uh, they got their their boy in there. They got their man, uh, whatever you want to call, him, uh, as as president. And then he began, you know, just rolling back workers' rights, trade union rights, and a country that says. A strong tradition of fighting for those rights. So uh, I think what's going on is the beginning of what's going to uh, expand uh, across the European Union. How it will <clears throat> expand, I don't know. But already Macron is scared enough that he's uh, agreed to postpone the gasoline tax for six months, I think. And uh, it's not about gasoline tax. It took on an organic dimension that people said we're sick of the 1% uh, destroying the 99% uh, of the population. You know, we're sick of these policies. We want France back again. We don't want France to be, uh, uh, you know, a, a suburb of Africa. Uh, we want France to be France with its own history, culture, pride, and, and tradition, and, uh, and its own economy instead of this globalization nonsense. So I think that's that's kind of what's going on here. And you see what uh, I've, I've seen videos of this. What, what Macron has ordered is that the French intelligence uh, insert uh, provocateurs, police, who you can see in films, uh, they go behind their van and start changing into civilian uniform, put on a yellow vest, and then start uh, uh, throwing rocks, you know, uh, to incite violence and so forth. And then the yellow vests uh, discover this, and they say, "Police, police! Look at that police agent!" <laughs> and they run away. So you know the to see this, and of course, what the mainstream media films are scenes of violence. And you think, "Oh, these these are nothing but hooligans and uh, like an antifa in the U.S. terrorists and and so forth." They're not, uh, you know, but this is genuine, and and uh, it's got it's got the uh, Powers that be freaked out, I think. And, uh, you know, th there's a plan. It goes back to the 1920s from certain circles in Europe. Kudenhof Kalergi uh, was one of the architects of this to destroy the borders of the nation state. Brzezinski in, the, in his book, uh, uh, The Technotronic Era Between uh, Two Ages, I think it was called, in the 1960s, uh, wrote that the nation state uh, is essentially finished, and uh, that uh, uh, actually it's a, it's a quote I like to cite if you allow me. Uh, in 1969, he wrote very prophetically because he was very close to David Rockefeller, who was one of the architects of this process, said the nation state, I quote, as a fundamental unit of man's organized life has ceased to be the principal creative force. International banks and multinational corporations are acting, planning in terms that are far in advance, it's certainly true, of the political concepts of the nation state. Well, uh, think Google, think Facebook, think, uh, you know, Apple and Amazon and, and, uh, and so forth. And these are, these are the corporate entities and the, and the big, Global banks like uh, uh, Citigroup, like uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, Goldman Sachs, and so forth, that are just—they have been deregulated and allowed to create 
such a massive size that, uh, you know, they simply tell governments what to do. You know, private banks should be regulated by governments, not the other way around. So this, this is, uh, this migration thing I'm con convinced is part of a longer term project to simply as George Soros with his uh, initiative on uh, migration, uh, International Migration Initiative, uh, NGO, uh, they talk about migration is the new normal. And, uh, you know, talk about millions per year coming into the EU, and they talk about the uh, U.S. migration channel from uh, Latin America uh, in, into the U.S. unlimited. And, uh, you know, if you think about it, the economic policy, which is a globalized policy of these corporations, created the poverty and created the wars in the Middle East, the so-called Arab Spring, created the wars in Africa. They financed them, they gave guns to both sides and so forth in order that they can come in and loot the raw materials. And then through those wars, like the war in Syria, uh, you create refugee flows. You know, people are desperate to get out. And in those refugee flows, you can also create embedded terrorists like ISIS or Al-Qaeda and so forth, bring those into Europe and, uh, you know, begin creating unlivable situation. And the amazing thing to most Germans is that the top level politicians in, in uh, Berlin are complicit in this. Merkel has no idea that she's going to change her policy. She insisted on signing this ridiculous uh, initiative, on uh, this compact for migration, it's not compact on migration, that you have certain, you know, principles that nations agree to. It's a compact for migration to encourage migration and, and uh, you know, make uh, opposing this a hate crime. And, and uh, you know, this is horrendous. This is fascism pure. Nations like people ought to have a right to decide who they're uh, their friends or their companions are, or their uh, citizens. This is the fundamental of, of national sovereignty. This is what, what nations are all about, with borders as well. Uh, it worked fine for, for <laughs> hundreds of years. So, you know, there's no need to stop that and uh, open everything up to chaos. So that's, I think, what is going on in France, and it's spreading. It's already spreading into Belgium. Uh, Germany is a much more controlled country. Uh, so you don't have the same kind of manifestation, although you've had uh, various groups, and then you've had some, I think, fake groups like Pegida created to give genuine protesters a bad name in Germany. But uh, but most Germans are fed up with this policy of Merkel. So, and also the fact that their pensions are being cut, they're told to work longer, more years, and. Uh, their health benefits, health insurance is being cut back. Uh, the quality is going down. The, the roads, the railroads, the state-owned railway system, which is partly privatized but mostly state-owned, the Deutsche Bahn is is a disaster. They don't invest in the upkeep of of uh, locomotives and, and uh, you know and the railroad. So trains don't run on time, as as uh, the expression goes. So. This is these are the genuine, real elements to this, and I, I don't see at all the, the hands of a color revolution. I, I think a lot of them look at what's going on with protests in the U.S. around the Trump election, and they maybe say, "Okay, let's try to protest some of these things ourselves." You know, let's let's say enough with this migration. We need to have a wall in Europe of some sort. And this is not fascism. This is normally how it how it should how it used to work you, you would come into the united states through a port of a point of entry and declare your citizenship show your papers and say why you're uh, applying for uh, you know asylum or whatever it is or a work visa you know if you have skills and so and that would be an orderly process but this is out of control and i i make a joke about this u.n migration pact because basically the u.n uh, and these folks want to force all countries to be subject to this and where they make illegal immigration 
uh, legal. And you know, I'm on yes. my, I'm on my third passport. I have three citizenships, three passports. So, oh. what have I been doing collecting passports all this time? When essentially you won't need a passport because now yeah. any, anyone can go anywhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but that's that's not how it's going to work. <laughs> and uh, just final question on the color revolution aspect. Last week yeah. we interviewed Dmitry Orlov uh, about his book Technosphere, and he briefly met, uh, wrote about color revolutions, and he used the term political technology. And do you? Th it's been a good twenty to thirty year run uh, by the U.S. Uh, in their use of this political technology, if you will. Do you yeah. think color revolutions uh, still work? Are they still effective? Less and less, uh, Russia has outlawed the NGOs as uh, undesirable NGOs, which I think is a very good idea. China has uh, cracked down, they're cracking down on everything. <laughs> the churches, religion, uh, uh, Uyghurs, and, and so forth. But uh, China has cracked down on them. Many, many countries have, have realized what these, that these NGOs are up to no good. If they haven't, they're just plain ignorant or corrupt, I think, today, because there's so many examples. That, that uh, So I think it's, it's running out of effectiveness. And uh, I think the other thing, and this is harder to judge, uh, of course, there are networks that have been embedded in the permanent bureaucracy in Washington uh, through the time. If you look back, I think this, this uh, destruction of the American uh democratic institutions or political institutions began uh significantly around after the assassination by the cia and others of, of jfk in 1963 and then uh, of course you had the scaling up of the vietnam war under johnson who did whatever the military industrial complex and the cia told him to do basically uh the but then you you had uh, the presidency of George Herbert Walker Bush, former head of the CIA, who uh, was ambassador to China and involved in some very corrupt dealings with uh, corrupt Chinese circles from everything I, I uh, can glean. And then George Bush, lasted for one term because he was not not very well loved he wasn't a lovable type contrary to his funeral orations then you had bill clinton who before he was president was identified as visiting kenny bunkport maine the bush family compound something like 17 times before the 1992 election he was governor of arkansas receiving uh illegal drug payments uh, in, uh, through allowing the Meta Arkansas airport to fly in cocaine from Columbia through, you know, CIA pilots and so forth. And they would bring stacks of hundred dollar bills into the governor's office and put them on the desk. So, you know, this is Bill Clinton. Uh, and then it went through the Clinton. There's a continuity of, of uh, destruction here that goes from Clinton, uh, eight years of, of uh, Clinton up to uh, the year 2000. And then you have, going back to the Bush family, George W. Bush and, and Dick Cheney, most of the key people around George W. were old Bush senior holdovers. And, you know, then you had the war on Iraq, the uh, war in Afghanistan, uh, all these regime change operations uh, going into high gear. And then you had, uh, after after uh, two terms of George W., you had Obama, who was part of the same machine with Hillary as, as the Secretary of State, you know, laughing at the, at the brutal assassination of Gaddafi in one of the few countries in Africa that before the color revolution there was was prosperous and peaceful and the, the people had uh, because Gaddafi wanted to have stability he made sure the oil revenues a good part of it went to his own people and uh, so now now we're at kind of an interesting turning point and i think the the venom and this is a conclusion i'm slowly coming to if i may extend on this point a little bit the venom being directed by the mainstream media and by the Democrats against uh, Trump. I think Trump 
was a president that wasn't supposed to be. Because you had written, I guess, some years ago, an article. Uh, I mean, and it's great to, you know, they say one of the the key skills for the 21st century is to learn, unlearn, and, and relearn. And I think you wrote an article some years ago about Trump and saying he's part of the same um, system. And what, what, what causes you to change your thinking now? Well, several American friends whom I respect and whose uh, political uh, feelers are, are pretty good started telling me to rethink this and realize that there's a genuine change going on in the country against this globalization phony nonsense of, of the last uh, 20 years or so, and that, uh, that Trump is very much a part of that. And I said, oh, this can't be true. But then I started uh, listening to videos, uh, reading speeches and, and so forth, and take the case of, of North Korea. North Korea, I was told by the late uh, James E. Lilly, who was a CIA senior officer for 30 years and, and a skull and bones uh, pal of George Bush Sr., uh, he was ambassador in uh, Beijing at the time of the Tiananmen Square business. I write about this in the book Manifest Destiny. And according to everything I uh, was able to research, and Chinese that I talked with in visits to China years ago, and, and uh, American journalists who were there at Tiananmen Square, there was never a government massacre by, uh, by of the students. But uh, James E. Lilly was the ambassador running the color revolution. It was one of the early color revolutions that didn't work. It, it, it flopped. And George Soros had to get out of the country. He was accused of being a CIA operative. Uh, which is probably not far from the truth. <laughs> I was sued by Soros for a million dollars over something I wrote about uh, his daughter's foundation in Tibet. But uh, be that as it may, I then I began looking at at uh, what Trump is doing on many levels, and and it's difficult because you have an embedded permanent bureaucracy that is committed to this destruction. And it's in the State Department and the Justice Department. Look, look at this guy, Comey. He's now back in the news. Uh, James Comey, the former director of the FBI, was put in charge of the Hillary Clinton uh, email server investigation during the election campaign, if you remember. And he gave a press conference where he stated that uh, even though there's evidence that we uncovered of, of uh, Clinton's uh, you know, abuse of, of the email rules, and even though uh, you know, there were classified documents on her private server and so forth, uh, we do not find any, uh, any grounds for, uh, what did he say? In, Although there's evidence of potential violations of the statutes regarding the handling of classified information, my judgment is that no reasonable prosecutor would bring such a case. Well, it's not the job of the FBI. The FBI are the cops. You know, it's not the cops' job to be a prosecutor. They give it to the prosecution, which is the Justice Department. So uh, he was in on the fix to cover up this incredible uh, email uh, abuse by, by Hillary Clinton. And the WikiLeaks uh, released just before the election of the so-called uh, Pizzagate emails uh, with, with Hillary and, and, and so forth implicated, her campaign chairman Podesta and, and others. Uh, this threatened to bring all the trees in the forest down. So now that's coming out, it turns out that the brother of uh, James Comey, Peter Comey, is a senior employee of the law firm DLA Piper in, in Washington that did the audit of the Clinton Foundation when Hillary was Secretary of State and using these her private email servers to, to do her official government business. And... You know, there's so much smoking gun of corruption here around this. This is now beginning to come out. And I think uh, that's creating a huge 
freak out in, in, in the democratic camp and in the camp of the people who are complicit in this such that they're trying to, uh, you know, uh, attack Trump for unbelievable, you know, charges of uh, impeachment because, uh, you know, he supposedly used campaign monies, his own apparently, uh, if that's the case, to, to buy the silence of, of this woman who claims that he had an affair with her. And, uh, you know, all these these sort of things that are coming up. But the real story, I think, is this private email server, the exchange of classified information to foreign governments, including Saudi Arabia, including the People's Republic of China, uh, and so on and so forth, and including Russia. There's a scandal about to come out again called Uranium One that is, to my mind, the real Russiagate scandal, and that involves Hillary Clinton as Secretary of State doing something very, very ugly with the with, uh, sale of, of a major chunk of U.S. uranium. So uh, what, what is Trump doing? His, his campaign slogan was, Make America Great Again, and now I began looking more closely at the trade war, and what do we have? We have China. I've been to China many times. I was very positive about the development I saw. They they were actually building things where Europe is kind of uh, going downhill, as, as has the U.S. in the last 40 years, U.S. economy. And I thought, well, China is really working hard and doing this. Turns out that since the time of Bill Clinton's presidency, 27,000 factories were dismantled in the U.S. The jobs, of course, were closed down and the factories moved to China by multinational corporations. And Clinton facilitated that uh, transfer. So, indeed, American jobs were, were uh, uh, ruined and, and the competitive advantage that, that China had was helped by friends from the outside and, and uh, uh, you know, billionaires abounded everywhere. So uh, I, I, I'm now beginning to relook at what, what Trump is doing with, with the trade war on China is, is a very calculated move, it began to become clear, and that is against something called China, Made in China 2025. It's a 10-point strategy that China will become not a leading competitor uh, or player, but the world leader in 10 areas of technology by 2040. 2025, it will achieve an irreversible uh, you know, forward momentum. And that includes such things as 5G uh, uh, telephony uh, communications, uh, something that's highly uh, controversial and highly dangerous in my view. Uh, but for the Internet of Things, well, you know, look more closely at what the Internet of Things is about. It's about this uh, electronic surveillance of all citizens everywhere. It's, it's uh, I don't need, uh, you know, a computer program to tell me when I open my refrigerator oh, your egg supply is getting low, you should mark it down on your shopping list to buy new eggs. Or you were at this restaurant uh, yesterday, do you want to give a rating? Do you want to go again, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Everything we do and, and everything we buy is, is going to be, uh, you know, in some data bank somewhere controlled by private corporations. And that's exactly, I think, what Brzezinski was was foreshadowing back in 1969 in that quote. So the areas, biotechnology, the Chinese just uh, bioengineered the first genetically edited humans, supposedly immune from HIV virus by uh, cutting the DNA thread at a certain place and injecting uh, virus from an HIV positive uh, male sperm and the twins somehow are born, but God knows what's going to happen, what kind of genetic mutations, because gene editing is not a stable, proven uh, technology. It's, it's highly controversial, even from some of the developers. So I began looking at this uh, trade war strategy and said, 
well, maybe there's something interesting here. For once, a president attacks the Federal Reserve, said this is very bad, what, what the Federal Reserve is doing to the economy with interest rates. And that's, that's the usual pattern of the Fed, if you look at historically. Greenspan did this time and again. Uh, every Fed chairman has, has done this. You raise interest rates at a time when, when bubbles build up because money is, is relatively cheap. And then you pop the bubble and you say, well, we can't tell when there's a bubble. This is nonsense. I know very well when there's a bubble. Uh, you know, stock markets overpriced and uh, all these other indicators. So uh, a president of the United States coming out attacking openly the Federal Reserve is un unheard of. And I think that's, that's a very interesting sign. So I'm at this point uh, withholding judgment and uh, going from uh, negative to neutral <laughs> in my evaluation of Trump and, and uh, watching to see if, if his administration is successful in bringing indictments to lawbreakers, uh, presumed lawbreakers uh, from all evidence, uh, such as Bill and Hillary Clinton, people in the Obama administration and so forth, then uh, I think we're looking at something genuine about draining the swamp. And it didn't appear so at the beginning. And I think part of the reason is the swamp was just everywhere. And how do you know you have to have a strategy to start? And that's what I began to see now uh, through the appointments of Whitaker as acting attorney general, someone who uh, realizes that the Mueller, F, F, you know, special investigation of the Russia Gate has simply gone out of control, and is looking for dirt on any direction. Uh, uh, simply to weaken the powers of the Trump presidency. So I, I think it's, it's, it's a time of titanic shifts going on. And I, I think some of the things that Trump is doing actually are, are, are rather positive. Other things I, I can't say I'm terribly excited by the, the tax law that he enacted two years ago. Uh, but and again, there might be parts of that that actually help the economy. Economist friends of mine in the U.S. who follow hard economic data tell me that the economy is genuinely doing better in the last two years. So, so maybe there is something to all this. Uh, and the idea of stopping, you know, the, the uh, uh, invasion, and I think that's the right word, is thousands of people being financed by private NGOs, uh, reportedly also Soros uh, NGOs, to uh, simply storm the wall on the borders of the U.S. coming from Honduras, including MS-13 gang members who, uh, according to reports, are CIA trained to be, uh, you know, gang terrorists. To if if they get an order, okay, we want you to get rid of this uh, guy and make it look like gang violence, uh, but. Uh, you know, these are drug gangs that are coming into America and the United States and, and uh, up to no good. You know, the families, legitimate families, half of Central America, according to opinion polls, would like to come to America for, as the land of choice, 130 million people. And, you know, it's, it's just, <laughs> let's do this in an orderly way, ladies and gentlemen. This is uh, not what nations are about. So I, uh, in this respect, even though he's attacked as a vicious, uh, you know, racist president, I don't think he's racist. I don't see that evidence. He's certainly not anti-Semitic. His own daughter is uh, a converted Jew, and his son-in-law is Jewish. Uh, he has good relations with, with Israel and, and so forth. So uh, they have trouble with him. He's kind of a, and he's got very good uh, support within the career military uh, who, felt that uh, Obama was really destroying, you know, the defenses of the country. So uh, let's see. I'm, I'm watchfully, critically uh, looking at this thing in a slightly different light. I, uh, in politics, I've learned over the years that uh, reality is often not what it's presented in the mainstream media. And that's very, that's very fair enough. And uh, as we're winding down, I guess one of my, my final question would be uh, 2018 is coming to a quick end. And 
2019 is upon us. And as you say, it's a very shaky time. And perhaps if you could just leave us with, you know, what do you think uh, we're heading into 2019? We've we've got um, some interesting events in the Middle East. Uh, Qatar just announced they're leaving OPEC. And then another report that Iraq might also. Uh, and then uh, in your book, you've written about it. As well, we see it in the daily headlines. The Saudi government is experiencing troubles and perhaps they're targeted for regime change. The war in Yemen. Uh, in one of your chapters, you talk about how Yemen might have as much oil reserves as Saudi Arabia on the border. Um, NATO has been talking about the accession of Macedonia, Montenegro, Bosnia, speeding those up, as well as, well as the economy. So, I mean, going into 2019... I don't know what, what what are the things that are on the top of your mind. I think uh, number one, I think we will not have a war with Russia. I, I don't think this is uh, going to happen. I think there are certain Russian oligarchs and certain networks uh, in and around uh, Moscow that uh, were trying to influence because they probably assumed that that Hillary would be the president, as most of the world did including Hillary. <laughs> uh, but then the voting machines didn't function as they should, maybe. I don't know. Uh, by the way, most of the voting machine companies are owned by... Uh, I, I recently discovered are owned by companies that are connected with George Soros and others like that, who are definitely pro-Clinton. So uh, I think we will not have war uh, I think there will be a huge upheaval in the political establishment in the U.S., huge upheaval. Uh, if it comes to arrests of, of prominent people like Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton and people around the Obama administration, uh, uh, I think that would be a very positive development because this this cesspool of corruption has to be cleaned out. They're, you know, promoting an agenda that's not only destroying the United States of America, it's destroying the nation state globally. And uh, if that is, is uh, losing steam and beginning to lose popularity, if people are realizing that this manipulation is going to kill them, literally kill their... Uh, uh, livelihood and their their ability to live a peaceful, decent life, uh, then this game might begin to change. Uh, in terms of the Middle East, I think what's going on in Saudi Arabia is the more I looked at this Khashoggi affair, the more I began to doubt the official narrative. The official narrative was governed by Erdogan, the president of Turkey, the whole Khashoggi business uh, smells of some kind of uh, setup, not only of Khashoggi, but maybe of Trump and, and uh, the Saudi prince, the Saudi royal house. And that might be because what uh, Trump's uh, son-in-law, Jared Kushner, did is go to Saudi Arabia and reportedly brief the prince, uh, MBS, Salman, on who in the royal family is plotting a coup to get get rid of Salman and uh, prevent him from becoming the next king. And suddenly, you remember uh, about a year ago, there were these mass arrests of, of billionaires, including Al-Walid uh, Al and uh, several princes, billionaire princes. And they were essentially uh, stripped of, of their uh, fortunes. Well, if you look at uh, Al Walid, he's a major donor to projects of the Clinton Foundation, to Citigroup, one of the dirtiest banks in the world, uh, City Corporation, and so money laundering and so. And these Saudi slush fund monies were a major factor in political corruption uh, by the cabal around uh, the Clintons, the Obamas, and so forth in the Bush family uh, over the last 30, 40 years. So if that is the background to this relation between Trump and, and MBS, then it would make sense. And the CIA seems to be really acting not in the interests 
of uh, the good of the United States and probably never has. Uh, I know Kennedy wanted to just, dis in his second presidency term, he wanted to dismantle the CIA as an institution because it was run by certain old families and it was like a private intelligence operation to extend their power. And uh, Dulles, Bush, uh, Scarlet and Bolton's and, and so forth. So the CIA seems to be playing a very dirty game against Trump in this particular case. And probably they rely on a lot of slush fund money for black operations coming from Saudi Arabia or did rely. So if that's being cut off, if, if the uh, black money from China that used to go to Hillary Clinton or Diane Feinstein uh, in the Senate or, or uh, Bill Clinton when he was president, if that's being cut off, then, you know, the, we could see in 2019 a major upheaval in, in some of the negative things going on inside the United States. And if that begins to happen, that will begin to have shockwave effect on those same kinds of networks in the European Union, in France, in Germany. Merkel was very, very closely tied with, with the Obama people and, and so forth. And uh, uh, when Trump came in, she just absolutely went berserk. So, uh, this is, this is, we're in a, as the proverb is, we live in very interesting times. Uh, and I think 2019 is going to become a decisive year, either where mankind is, is, is human beings begins to say, okay, we're losing our fundamental values. Let's, uh, stop this geoengineering weather modification, uh, experiments with, climate on the planet, let's stop all this GMO poison that we give our children is, and call it food, the agribusiness destruction of, of uh, healthy food uh, production in the world, you know, the globalization of, of agriculture, and uh, let's bring the central banks under political control. The Constitution, it was a coup d'etat in 1913 when the Federal Reserve was created as a private central bank. So I think all of these things potentially could be on the agenda in 2019. If they are, I think the world will breathe a great sigh of relief. Few people, unfortunately, have, have a, a glimpse as to what's been done over the past 30, 40 years, but it's, it's beginning to change, and that gives me optimism. Well, it's going to be interesting, and it's always a pleasure talking with you, William. Uh, I would recommend listeners go out and get every single one of your books from Century of War to Manifest Destiny. I know I have multiple copies of, of each. Uh, and finally, how can people best follow you, your work, support you? Uh, if you go to my website, which is William Engdahl, spelled my name without anything in between, E-N-G-D-A-H-L, WilliamEngdahl.com, very simple. Go to my website, and there a window will pop up offering a free subscription to my monthly newsletter, geopolitical newsletter. And uh, then you go on to the website itself and you find links to most of my articles over the past uh, five or six or more years. And there you can access for free. So if, uh, if people go there, they will find YouTube interviews like, like this and, uh, 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 as I say, the articles and also links to my books. So that that's the best way to follow. And they can uh, leave a donation as well. So um, thank you. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.